It is wide. You know all our hopes. You know all our dreams. Words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts. Hear our spirits sing. Song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain, from these lips of mine And if I had a thousand years I would still run out of time If you listen to my heart Every beat will say Thank you for the life Thank you for the truth Thank you for the Listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough. To tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. Please 
Please listen to our hearts Hear our spirits sing A song of praise that flows From those you have redeemed We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are But words are not enough To tell you of our love So listen to our hearts Words are not enough To tell you of our love So listen to our hearts No words are not enough To tell you of our love so listen to us. Better is one day in your house, 
better is one day in your court, thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your court, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere. Than a thousand elsewhere. One thing I ask, and I would see to see your beauty. Find you in a place your glory dwells. One thing I ask, and I. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day. cry out for you the living God your spirit's water for my soul I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you He 
understand Time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The God in three in one Father, Spirit, Son Good morning. It is the Lord's Day, and we are glad to worship together, even through cyberspace. So as Christians, even during times of stress, our hearts are together on the Lord's Day. We worship, we pray, we get into the Word. Let's open our hearts to Him right now. Heavenly Father, we thank You that despite the fact that so many crises are in our world today. Despite that, you are with us, you gather us even when we can't see one another all the time, and you have a plan to bless and strengthen us and to use us in a fallen world. We thank you for these things. We pray that you would bring us perspective this morning as we meditate on your word, as we think of the events of the last 10 days uh, and the crisis of the fires and the other things in our country. We pray, Father, that you would give us insight, wisdom, peace, encouragement, direction as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, as you know, uh, the last 10 days have seen some of the unprecedented, that's a word that's overused in the year 2020, but uh, truly unprecedented crises in Southern Oregon. In addition to the other national things that have been going on with COVID and so on, uh, it has been an eventful 10 days, and we've not been able to meet uh, here on our campus because we were allowing our campus to be used by various other community services that were helping in fighting the fire and so on, and we're glad to do that. But before we get back into our normal pattern uh, in the book of Acts, I felt it would be good for us to spend one more Sunday considering how to navigate difficult times. Because, you know, the Lord is very realistic about difficult times. As you remember from the last message, last Sunday, Psalm 46, the normal life in a fallen world is difficult. And the scriptures are very, very clear that we should expect it to be difficult. And that didn't mean that 
God was absent in the process, like we sometimes think. If life is hard, God must not be here. Exactly the opposite is true in the scriptures. From beginning to end, the Lord says, I'm, I am there. You've got to expect life to be hard. I will help you if you'll come to me. So what we're going to do this morning is look at a passage uh, in, I'll tell you where it is, it's Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. So if you have your Bible, open your Bible to Matthew 14, verse 22. And it's a famous story uh, of how the Lord sent his own disciples into a storm. And as we look at this, once again, the goal here is for us to learn how to navigate the difficult times, the hard times. Uh, people don't realize a lot of times that Jesus actually endured very difficult times with his own disciples in his three and a half year ministry, culminating in his own crucifixion, the ultimate difficulty, you might say. So there's much to be learned about how we navigate our lives uh, from a passage like this. Now, uh, the background for this passage is that he had, uh, John the Baptist has recently been killed. This was a major thing. We don't have time to go into it, but this was a major thing for the disciples of Jesus. Many of them had been disciples of John the Baptist, and he was executed, beheaded. So right here in the discipleship's own life, uh, the di disciples' own life, lives, you can see this sense that, hey, we are on the edge. There, there really is a violent world around us. There really are trials. People's lives are lost in the process of the work of God on earth. John the Baptist had, had uh, been executed and had a huge impact on, on the disciples. And recently, just previous to the events that we're going to read here, where there's the storm at sea and so on, Jesus had, has fed the 5,000. They're up in Galilee and somewhere on the hillside. You, you remember the story, miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Um, but then after that is when these things take place. He sends his disciples into what turns out to be a storm. And in this process, we're trusting the Lord to teach us a few things. Let's begin in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 14. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat. That means right after the 5,000 had been fed. And it would have been late in the day, around dusk, that he says to his men, get in the boat. These were fairly long boats, 24, 25 feet long. And uh, you could get several guys in it, and that's exactly what they did. And they knew the boats well. They were fishermen. They knew how to use them. They, they were able to row them, and they could actually set up a sail if they needed to. They knew what they were doing. And they're in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. So when he says, sends them across, it's not in the broadest part of the Sea of Galilee. It's in the northern part. It's about five miles across that, where they're going to go. So he made his disciples get into the boat and, uh, <clears throat> and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So everybody's eaten, and they would have stayed all night. They would have stayed forever as long as Jesus was willing to talk to them. But he said, we're done for the day. So he, he says to his friends, get in the boat. I'll meet you on the other side later. And so they do that, and, he, and then he dismisses the crowds. He says, everybody's got to go home. Um, after he had dismissed the crowds, verse 23, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Have you ever been peopled out, sort of? It's wonderful to spend some alone time with the Lord, with the, our Heavenly Father. And there are times when the exhaustion and the, and the stress of life and ministry and so on is such that the only cure for it is some quiet time praying. Jesus did this often, and he teaches us to do it too. So after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the, for the wind was against him. So uh, they were fighting the wind, and the, the waves on the Sea of Galilee can get pretty sizable, especially for the small boats that they had. They were, they, these boats were relatively shallow draft. They were not made for the ocean going, you know, and so the waves would be quite scary. And uh, 
So he had been praying now for several hours by the time this takes place. The boat was by this time a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, that would have been between three and six in the morning. So they have um, been dealing with this for some time, for several hours, while he was praying. And suddenly, while he's praying, he becomes aware of what's going on. The chances of him seeing this at night from this distance, because they would have been about three miles out. We know that from other passages. Uh, they would have been about three miles out on a five-mile journey. So they're, they're past the halfway point. They're fighting the weather, and they have been for some time fighting the weather. Uh, it's between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning, and he sees them out there. And he came to them walking on the sea. Now, we know from the other passages and from this one that he didn't calm the sea yet. Not until after he talks to Peter and so on does he calm the sea. So he walks out there in the middle of the storm. The waves are there. The wind is there. The guys are probably hauling on the oars. It's a tense scene. And Jesus walks up and then he stands off from the scene. He stands off from it to get their attention. The disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. <laughs> and he, he cried, uh, they cried out in fear. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the Lord does tell them immediately. He spoke to them. It says, he said, take heart. It's me. Don't be afraid. And yet he allowed them to be afraid for a little while. He knew they were going to be afraid. He knew they were afraid when he went out there. And he had perceived that these things were taking place. He, he couldn't have seen it from the hill at night, three miles across the sea during a storm. So it had to have been revealed to him by the Father during his prayer time, what was going on out there. And he perceived it, is what it said. So it's something of a miracle that he actually saw and walked out straight to them without GPS, okay? I mean, think about how the Lord orchestrates the situation so that there is some, something to be afraid of, but then he stands off in order to make some points for his men. He wants them to understand some points, some things. And so he's, the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Take heart. It's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter answered him. Again, the storm hasn't stopped. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's really you, then command me to come to you on the water. Peter's, it's a little bit of a gamble, you know, is it really you standing on that water? If it really is you, then command me to come. And the Lord says, come. It's interesting, it was Peter's idea. It was Peter's idea to do this. And the Lord says, okay, let's do it. Have you ever had, have you ever thought to yourself, I wouldn't do anything unless I felt it was Jesus's idea? Just a sidebar here, but you know, Christians sometimes come up with good ideas. And uh, it's okay to say, Lord, I have an idea. And you know what? He might say, give it a shot. I have an idea, Lord. And, and the Lord might say, give it a shot. Now, you know that when Peter gets out there a little ways, he starts to sink. Okay. But that's not a sin. It's not a sin to make a mistake trying to do something good, especially if the Lord said, give it a shot, give it a try. You know, there's this great relationship we have with God through Christ, where he talks to us, we talk to him. We give things a try. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's not the end of the world. Anyway, so <laughs> I love the fact that, that Peter says, uh, I want to try this. And Jesus says, okay, do it. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water. <laughs> and we don't know how far he walked, but he walked on the water for a little while. And, <clears throat> and he came to Jesus and he got apparently right up close to him. But then when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Now, you see, the storm hadn't stopped. They had to speak to each other over the wind and over the waves. And Peter had to walk out 
trusting that the water would firm up under every step he took. He must have been looking at Jesus while he was doing this. He had to have been. Uh, but then he decides not to. He decides to look at the waves, apparently, and the, and the wind. And he begins to sink. And I love that. And he's beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. How long does it take to sink from the time you begin? You can do this at, uh, you know, with a swimming pool. You do a little experiment. Step out onto the water and see how long it takes you to sink once you begin to step on the water. So this is happening in a very short period of time. Suddenly, he's, he, in the, in the amount of time it takes you to step on water and fall all the way into it, all right, in that amount of time, he feels this coming on. He screams out <laughs> to the Lord, and the Lord reaches out and grabs him. It's just a wonderful scene. Uh, he said, Lord, save me. Save me, and he uses the word that we, the normal word for salvation, right? It's the word for salvation, sozo. And, uh, and in this case, it means rescue me from the water. He doesn't have a life jacket on. Most of these guys actually, uh, they knew how to swim, but, you know, it's, it's terribly frightening. And it would have been life-threatening. And uh, he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. So in, the, in an instant, and you can just imagine, can you imagine being Peter? And I don't know where the Lord took hold of him, maybe his hand, maybe his shoulder or something, but he t Jesus touches him, grabs hold of him, and immediately Peter's able to stand on the water again while Jesus is right there with him. And he's looking, what a, it's just an amazing scene, it's wonderful. <laughs> took hold of him and he said, oh, you little faither, little faith person. Why did you doubt? Why did you... Why did you let go of thinking about me and start thinking about the world, the world around you? And uh, when they got into the boat, then the wind ceased. So however far they were, we don't know, but it was enough that it would have been a real walk for Peter to walk out there to him. Um, they walked back together to the boat. And when they get back in the boat, then the wind stopped and the, everything. Is, and, you know, it stopped and, and the boat would still have been rocking, and it's quiet now, all of a sudden. The storm's gone. Jesus is in the boat. And those in the boat, the other disciples, uh, worshipped the Lord and said, Truly, you are the Son of God, the beginning of, uh, of genuine faith. Uh, let's look at this, and I, I want to make some comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to mention three things. First is this. Take note, please. And, and remember, we're talking about navigating hard times. We're talking about dealing with the storms of life. Do you mind if I have some coffee? I know you have coffee. If it's 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, you probably got your coffee. And notice my cup. Keep calm and carry on. That's what we're doing. Take note of this first. The storm is real. This isn't a parable. This really happened to these guys. The storm is very real. Life is surprising. And life is frightening. Very often, our lives, we never know what's going to come at us in a given day. We think we do. And many days seem to be the same, more or less. But as what happened uh, 10 days ago, on Tuesday, when these fires struck, and swept through and destroyed two whole towns here in Southern Oregon, Talent and Phoenix, and, and literally chased people out of their homes and some people didn't make it. Who knew when they woke up that morning what life had in store for them this day? The fact of the matter is, the storm is real. Don't pretend it's not. Life can be and is quite frightening. And seriously dangerous. Life is seriously dangerous. This is not a dress rehearsal. Every day when you get up, you if you're a Christian, you live by faith and not by sight. You're trusting that the Lord's going to get you through the day and that he's going to show you how to navigate the day. But sometimes the storms hit and you're disoriented and 
fearful. That's exactly what's going on here. This was a very real storm. And take note as well as a subheading to that, Jesus sent them into it. He sent them into it. And I'll talk more about this in a few minutes, but it's interesting that they didn't blame him. They didn't say, why did you send us into a storm? Life is supposed to be easier than this. They didn't do that. But he did send them across the lake and the storm hit. So were they in God's will when the storm hit? Yeah, right in the middle of the will of God and the storm hits and it's fearful and, they're, and they feel their lives are being threatened. And yet they're right in the middle of God's will. Isn't that odd? We tend to think that if we're in the middle of God's will, there isn't a feeling of fear. There's no sense of uh, threat to our lives. That's how we can tell we're in God's will. Uh, we feel completely safe and a lot of times very self-confident. And then something, a storm hits, some bad thing happens, something very fearful, and, and we think, where did I miss God's will along the line? No, 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 no. You may not have missed God's will at all. More on that in a little while. But take note, the first thing I want you to see is that the storm is very real. It's not a parable. And that reminds us that life is real. It's very surprising and very frightening at times. Don't be surprised when life frightens us. Second thing to note is that Jesus is more real than the storm. When he walks across the sea, I wonder if, I don't know, I, I may be reading into it, but I wonder if when he was up there praying and the father said, your boys are in the storm now, go down there, walk across and talk to them and calm them down. Walk across the sea. I wonder if the father said, now's the time to do that. Let's go. Go and do that. Um, whatever the case may be, one of the, the most amazing thing is that even though the storm is real and it's just crashing and it's got all their attention. I mean, when you're, when you're in a situation like this in a crisis, it, it gets all your attention. And then Jesus walks across and what's he doing? See, he could have all the way from the mountain, he could have said, stop the storm. He doesn't have to actually be on the water to talk to it. And the water always has to do what he says. Okay, so why didn't he just from the mountain say, <clears throat> stop the storm and let the guys get across? It's because he wanted to demonstrate to, the, to his friends. And he wants to demonstrate to us, friends, that he's more real than the storm we're facing. F from this moment, I mean, he fills the screen in the lives of these disciples. He fills the screen of their minds. The storm was filling it, but the reason he walks across, doesn't stop the wind yet, stands, you know, off from the boat a little ways and goes through this entire thing with Peter is to demonstrate that the Lord himself is more real than the crisis we're in. He's the founder of the creation. It's his voice that creates. It's hard for us to get that into our minds, but it's, it's something we have to grasp. The Lord is more real than whatever crisis we're facing. And we feel, no, he's less real and he's not paying attention. And, and, and I really, maybe I can't trust him because in this case, maybe a fire, maybe took my, my home or, or, or my property or, or there's been a death or there's been some horrible crisis. And it just so fills our mind and we say, Lord, where are you? And he says, I'm standing right here. And, I, and you have to be reminded, I am more real than the thing that you are experiencing right now. I know it's difficult for us to get our minds around that. That's one of the reasons, though, that he stood off from the boat and let the guys see everything that was going on here, rather than simply stopping the storm ahead of time. So the storm is real, and life is a storm. And it is very real, but Jesus is more real than the storm. And we need to sometimes sit down and be reminded of that. And here's the third thing I want to point out, and we'll spend a little time on this, and that is that faith is the knowledge of both of these things. I've often said, and I, I repeat it, faith is not the absence of knowledge. It's the presence of a certain kind of knowledge. 
And you see the faith of these men grows in the midst of this crisis because they become aware that Jesus is more real than the crisis. Faith is a kind of knowledge of that reality. Faith is knowledge of the fact that the Lord Jesus himself is more real than anything we happen to be facing right now, even though what we happen to be facing is very real. We're not denying the suffering and the difficulty in this world. When you put those two things together, where you're realistic about the world, but then you understand that the Lord is more real than the trauma, that is the, that is the knowledge that is called faith, okay? Faith is a kind of knowledge. It's where you, you actually start with the existence of God. You, you actually begin to trust him. So let's talk about that just a little bit. And this, uh, let me point out that this kind of knowledge emerges and actually develops, it actually, it actually is promoted within crisis, within crisis, within trauma. This is, this is what's going on. And uh, that's, there's four things I want to mention. And if you're a note taker, you might want to note them. The first one I just said, faith actually grows best in times of crisis, not in times of ease. Isn't that true? I mean, haven't you found that to be true yourself? I totally have. Uh, during times of, of great crisis in my life, through my life, I have found my faith stretched almost to the breaking point. I thought maybe past the breaking point at times. But then when it grew back, the depth of it, the knowledge of God in the process was so much deeper that I would not trade what I learned in, that, in the stress of that experience, even though I would have avoided the stress of that experience if I could have. But the Lord allowed it to come into my life and then deepened my understanding of him because faith actually grows during crisis. Uh, people who really do know the Lord, when, when things are starting to go in the wrong direction or, or like in our uh, community over the past 10 days, uh, there's this great destruction that takes place. People who really do know the Lord, um, their faith actually begins to grow. And some people, when they face a great crisis, it's the first time they ever think about God in the first place. And they think, I need a, a stronger reason for living than my previous reasons because my everything I thought was stable is now gone. Where am I going to look? Well, see, that's where faith actually grows in the midst of a crisis. The storm is really, really important. No storm, um, then there's no increased awareness of Jesus' person and presence. Without that storm, they wouldn't have seen him walking. If they hadn't have been scared in the first place, it wouldn't have amazed them. And it, wouldn't, it would not have been the relief that it needed to be to see that he was the Lord of the storm. The storm is really, really important. And so was the struggle. And notice that they were rowing and they were rowing against the wind. In the middle of God's will, doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, rowing against the wind and thinking to themselves, there's got to be an easier way to be a disciple. You know, I would have been thinking that. And they did this for several hours, from dusk until three to six in the morning. And for, the, for several hours, they're fighting it. It would have been five miles across that portion of the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And they're at about three miles. They're past the halfway point. They have to keep trying to get to the other side now. What's my point? The point is struggle. Why did, why did the Lord wait until they were really pretty much at the end of their rope, so to speak? They'd been doing this for several hours. They were exhausted. They were frightened. Why did he wait so long to do this? And um, let me suggest, just suggest it to you and, and consider it. The struggle is actually part of the growth of the faith. The struggle is actually important. And we tend, again, it's counterintuitive when the Lord says, struggling is a part of the Christian faith. A part of walking with the Lord is not understanding some things and feeling fearful and frustrated at times and wondering, why this crisis? Why now? Um, and still having to row. <laughs> uh, they couldn't get out of it. You ever been in a situation that's 
feels intolerable to you, but you can't get out of it. They had nothing else they could do except keep rowing and keep trusting somehow that something was going to happen. Now, see, that's a struggle for us, but it's not a bad struggle. It's actually a good thing. Counterintuitive, but it's a good thing. This is why in James chapter 1, James advises uh, all of his friends, uh, the disciples at the time, he advises them to view the trials that they face in a more positive light. Not, not that the trial itself is good by itself, but he says, consider it good because what it does is it stretches faith. It, it actually increases faith. And we think faith should grow in easy times. If I had easy times, my faith would grow. Actually, what happens during easy times is faith becomes flaccid. It becomes, uh, it's not strong. It's not, it's not lean and strong and courageous. The lean, strong, courageous kind of faith almost invariably is developed during a crisis. So, it grows best in times of crisis, not in times of ease. Second thing to note about it, the faith, or this knowledge, this uh, <clears throat> transforming knowledge of God is that it focuses first on Jesus as the sovereign Lord. Now see, they see him coming and, and this now is the beginning of faith because when he gets in the boat, they begin to worship him. That means their whole orientation to reality now has changed. It's, it's all changed. It focuses, what, uh, your faith actually focuses on Jesus as the sovereign Lord, not on the condition of the world. Boy, and this is something we need to remember. Our faith focuses on Jesus as the sovereign Lord, not on the condition of the world, even when the world is on fire. Last Wednesday, here at TCF, my voice is a little raspy because of the smoke. But last Wednesday, here at TCF, we were standing outside the office looking across the road, smoke just billowing, and the fire got within 400 yards of us. We, we, Pastor Garrett has a little gizmo, and he can see how far things are away, and he looked through it, and he goes, that's 400 and something yards. Uh, that is really close. I had friends emailing me from Portland because they looked at the map on where this thing was, and they know where our church is. And one of my friends up there emailed me and said, that fire is right on top of you. <laughs> I got the email later that day and I said, yeah, it was. We were, we were really wondering what was going to happen. And you know what? That, I'll tell you it something that went on in my mind. Uh, on the one hand, I believed that the Lord was going to preserve the church. Um, and we had a lot of firefighters here and, and, we believed that we were in a pretty safe place because of that. But then I thought to myself, well, what if it really did burn? What if the firefighters weren't here? And, uh, and what we have here on this campus, which is a good campus, what if we lost it? What if it burned? Or an earthquake came and it just became rubble? And I had to say, well, Lord, honest and truly, this is your place. This belongs to you. There is a sense in which we as Christians have to actually keep the focus entirely on the Lord and realize that everything actually does belong to him. Um, it helped me to make that decision as we're watching this fire. And by God's grace, uh, the fire did not overwhelm us. But see, at times like that, the tendency is to look at the condition of the world. And in Peter's case, he was looking at the wind and the waves. We were looking at fire across the road. And, and the Lord says, eyes here, you know, like we do with our kids. You know, we turn their little faces so they look straight at us. Have you ever done that with your kids or your grandkids? Where they're looking around and you kind of gently put your hand on their little face so that they can look straight at you. Listen to me, look at me. This is what he's saying. See, real faith focuses first on Jesus as the sovereign Lord and not primarily on the world. And you can see this because the, the goal of this whole account is the, at the end where they said, truly, you are the son of God. It's in a, uh, and, and when Peter says, save me, Lord, see, he, he realizes that he, 
he actually had started to look at the ways. Now he has to, he has to actually look directly at the Lord and he's kind of desperate to do that. Well, that's actually how faith works. It focuses first on him as the sovereign Lord. This has been a hard year. <laughs> um, 2020, the political upheaval in the culture is creating a great deal of fear, not to say paranoia, among Christians. Uh, the COVID crisis has raised everybody's uh, awareness of illness for one thing but it's also raised the 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 ire and the anger level uh, across the country and and you can feel that pressure uh it's been a very hard year and then here in our local area and really in the entire western part of the united states it's on fire <laughs> the worst fires ever really firemen i talked to here who are experienced for years and years they're looking at this and they're saying, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, like I said, the word unprecedented has been used a lot for this year. Let me ask you this. Has all of this gotten your eyes off of the Lord? You, know, you see how he says to Peter, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And what he means is, why did you look at the condition of the world instead of looking at me? It's a really important question that we need to ask ourselves. When we are facing crisis, are we enamored of the crisis or are we able to actually say, Lord, I need to actually spend more time with you. In the midst of this crisis, I need to carve out the time to think about you. Well, I would suggest that second course of action because real faith when crisis is taking place, focuses on the Lord and not on the condition of the world. And in all of my years of pastoring, 40 some odd years of pastoring, never have I seen a greater need for genuine believers to do precisely this than right now. And getting our minds focused on the Lord, on the gospel, on the power of the gospel, on, the, on what he's doing in, in this world, rather than on the political situation, on the health and the COVID thing, or even on the fires. Even though we pay attention to all these things and try to help, our minds have to be stayed on God. Focus first. So, uh, number one, it grows. Faith grows best in times of crisis, not in times of ease. It's difficult for us to grasp that, but James chapter one. Let me give you another passage there. First Peter chapter one, verses six and seven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. No time to turn there, but it's a wonderful passage. Secondly, faith focuses first on the sovereign Lord, Jesus Christ. The sovereign Lord. The one who's in charge of the weather. The one who's in charge of the fire. The one who's in charge of the whole thing. It focuses on him and not on the condition of the world, as if the world functioned separately from the will of God. A lot of people treat the world as if it functions completely separately from the will of God. It's not true. It's not true. The Bible's very clear. The world does not function separately from the will of God. God's at work in it. Here's the third thing to note. Faith relies, faith relies entirely on sheer grace, not on human skill. Sheer grace. Now, human skill is used sometimes. Uh, we see skillful firefighters and skillful law enforcement officers that were at work answering prayer. They didn't know they were answering prayer, <laughs> but they were answering prayer. People's homes were saved and people's homes were protected from, uh, from looters. And, and the Lord was using other human beings to accomplish these things in order to answer prayers. However, beginning to end, genuine faith trusts the grace of God, not the human skill by itself. It trusts the grace of God, not the human skill by itself. And that's, you see this with Peter. He's walking along, and I don't know what was going through his mind. Maybe he's thinking, whoa, I know how to do this now. I'm going to walk on this water for more. And then all of a sudden, whoo, he goes under. I don't know. But I do know this. One of the most, well, the most important phrase in this entire, in this entire story, this entire account is, Lord, save me. That's the most important phrase. Because if Jesus doesn't reach out single-handedly and save him by sheer grace, sheer grace, if Jesus doesn't do that, 
Peter's in the water and he drowns. And that's how salvation works. It is, it is by sheer grace, not by human skill, human prowess, human knowledge. This is not lessons in how to walk on water, even though we can learn some spiritual lessons from it. You know, keep your eyes off the waves and on the Lord, and that's a good thing always to learn. But don't think that this is uh, water walking lessons, and that's why this, is, this passage is here. This passage is here to, to remind us that we are touched by the grace of God and that's the only thing that can save us. Genuine faith puts its full weight down, not on its own ability to walk on water or do whatever is necessary. It puts the full weight down on the Lord's ability to simply reach out in sheer sovereign grace, take hold of you and literally pull you out of the water and save you forever. Now, when you get that in your head and in your mind, and you realize he has saved me that way, then, you, then when you walk back with him, you realize everything in your life from then on is sheer grace. And every ability you have, because Peter did walk on the water with Jesus back to the boat, but he's walking with Jesus, see? And he's not taking credit for learning how to walk on water. He's saying, this is the grace of God that's enabling me to do whatever I'm doing. It relies, real faith relies entirely on sheer grace not on human skill. Interesting too, how the Lord walks with us through these dark times. Psalm 23, which we won't have time to meditate on maybe another time, but it says that he guides us for his name's sake in the right paths, the paths of righteousness. And then the very next thing it says is, so when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, he's with us. He's with us in this process. And it is sheer grace that he's with us from beginning to end. And we have to understand that. We have to sense his presence with us, especially when there's a storm. And that storm stayed until Jesus got in the boat, which means he and Peter walked through the storm back to the boat. I mentioned this last week in Psalm 46, and um, I just want to remind us, he is with us in the midst of it all. He never promises to keep us from storms or from trials. We saw that last week, and you see it all through the Bible. But he does promise to be with us in the midst of it. And Psalm 23 is one of the Psalms that speaks to that. So faith grows best in times of crisis, not in times of ease. It focuses first on Jesus as the sovereign Lord and not the condition of the world around us. And third, it relies entirely on sheer grace, not on human skill. And that human skill, you know, we tend to put a lot of focus on our ability to do stuff. Then when we fail, we feel horrible. Don't you? Don't you feel terrible when you fail? When you try to do something good? <laughs> Peter, as he's thinking, you know, he's thinking to himself, this was stupid. This was my idea. And I walked out here and the Lord let me do it. And now look at me. I'm sinking. I'm failing. But you know, Jesus could have stopped him from failing. He didn't stop him from failing. He reached out and saved him by grace. And we have to live with that reality. We have to live with the fact that he does that. It's a great way to live, not human skill. We're gonna fail, you're gonna fail, you have failed. <laughs> it was your idea, the Lord said, give it a shot, it started to fail, and now you're thinking, I missed the, I missed the boat, God's not with me anymore, because I'm sinking. No, just reach out, cry out, say, Lord, save me, the Lord will save you and you haven't sinned and you haven't, just because you're sinking, it, he, he doesn't call him a sinner at that point. It's just a learning, it's a, it's a teachable moment. Failures are teachable moments, but it doesn't mean we're outside of God's love. Let me just, let me just offer something to you. If you are a Christian who, who is still beating yourself up over a failure, you're still beating yourself up over a failure in your life, in which maybe you felt like you stepped out of the boat on your own or whatever you did, and then you sank, and you think, well, the Lord is done with me now. And may I suggest to you, Christian friend, God is never done with you. You're part of his family, he loves you, he will draw you back in. Um, failure is never terminal for a believer. Once they've given their life to Christ, Attempting to do that which is good and failing in the process, there's no sin in that. 
And sometimes we have it in our mind how we ought to succeed. And the Lord says, that'll be up to me. We'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, the Lord's grace sustains. It relies entirely on sheer grace, not on human skill. And here's the fourth and the last uh, concerning faith as the knowledge that grows in the midst of the crisis. It's this, faith leans into God, not away from him. Now, sometimes when really bad things happen, even a genuine Christian, because they're so disoriented, they have this deer in the headlights thing that happens to them where they're just kind of disoriented and, and they seem to wander away from the Lord. But he doesn't let them wander too far. They, they eventually kind of come to their senses and they come back to him because genuine faith will eventually turn to the Lord instead of away from him. And the stronger the faith, the quicker the person will turn to the Lord in a crisis instead of away. The stronger a person's faith is, the quicker they turn to the Lord when a crisis occurs, rather than getting mad at him and, and walking away. Getting mad at the Lord and walking away from him during a crisis, first of all, doesn't do any good. You never. I mentioned this in the last message. It doesn't do any good to walk away from God when things are hard. Genuine faith draws in to the Lord, reaches out, says, save me, Lord. Peter didn't get mad at him, didn't get mad at Jesus for letting him sink, you know, or for letting the storm happen in the first place. It would be profoundly faithless to respond to crisis by shaking your fist at God and, and trying to walk away. It's a weak faith that does that. Now, let me, let me add, Sometimes genuine Christians don't have as strong a faith as they think they do until it's tested. And, and when it's tested, they sometimes will shake their fist at God. Maybe you've done this, um, and yet you know you're a genuine believer, and it's always bothered you that you shook your fist at God because he doesn't let you go forever in that direction. He will reach out. He'll, it's like a fisherman, tick, 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 tick. tick. He just, you, you can sound, you know, you can, you can run away. And, but he's got you on the line and he'll pull you back in. There is sometimes among Christians, this uh, when their faith is tested by really traumatic situations, they will, they will immediately bolt, but then they will come back. Um, and that's because a genuine faith will eventually lean into God. And the stronger it is, the quicker it leans into God. The quicker it says, everything I own belongs to you, Lord. Um, if you take it away, I trust you in the process, even though I grieve, I trust you and I'm going to lean into you and I want to get closer to you instead of turning away. So those four things, faith grows best in times of crisis, not in times of ease. It focuses first on Jesus as the sovereign Lord and not on the condition of the world. It relies entirely on sheer grace and not on human skill. And it leans into God and not away from him. As we face crisis in our culture right now and, and, and in our own little community here, how are we doing with these things? How are we looking for the Lord to strengthen our faith in this process? Let me offer some pastoral advice <clears throat> in closing for, uh, for navigating. Navigating very, very difficult times. Here's the first piece of advice. You must assume, and, and, and this is faith when you assume this, assume that the Lord loves you and is doing something good in you and through you. Make that assumption. That is Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. In fact, you know, most, many people have it memorized, Romans 8, 28, but they have it memorized a little bit wrong. And, uh, and so I want to I wanna read it to you. And if you have your Bible, turn to it, even if you think you have it memorized. Romans 8, 28. Uh, back up to verse 26, and we'll see it in its context. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. It admits we're weak. Romans 8, verse 26. For we do not know what to pray, pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, especially this is in crisis. A lot of times you don't know what to pray for, but you pour your heart out to God the best you can, and he translates it, and he answers the prayer according to what we would have asked for if we knew as much about it as him. That's what this is saying. 
It's a wonderful promise. And he who searches hearts, do you see that in verse 27, 827 of Romans? He who searches hearts, he's searching our hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, that's us, the Spirit intercedes, according to the will of God. Wonderful promise. The Spirit intercedes for us constantly so that God's will is accomplished in our lives, even through crisis. You see how that works? This is why we have to make the assumption God is on our side. Make the assumption that he loves you, that you're in his love and in his grace, no matter what horrific trauma may come into your life. You gotta assume that he loves you. That's what he's saying here. And then verse 28, see? Because we know that for those who love God, all things work together. The Greek word means it's kind of choreographed together, that God makes the circumstances work towards what he wants done. Works together for good. But it doesn't say, please note, it doesn't say all things are good. You know that little phrase we use? Oh, it's all good. I know what we mean. What we mean is don't worry about the situation right this minute. It's going to be okay, blah, 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 blah. But the fact of the matter is not all things are good. There's some very bad things and very bad actions and people who are enmeshed in very bad deeds. He's not saying that all things are good. What he's saying is he's able to work, choreograph even very hard things that are part of the fallenness of the world. They're part of the sin of the world. He's able to choreograph them in such a way that they work together, okay? They work together. The things themselves aren't good but he choreographs it so that something good comes out of it for the people who belong to him. That's why Joseph, in the Joseph story in Genesis, in Genesis 50, verse 20, he had been sold into slavery, remember that, and was the victim of profound injustice for many, many years of his life. And then when his, when his brothers finally came to him, and he really was the prime minister of Egypt at the time, uh, the Lord had elevated him and given him this authority. And his brothers came and they were afraid that he would be angry. And he said, you meant it for evil. He does not let him off the hook for that. You did mean it for evil. You sold me into slavery, he says to his brothers, which they did. Do you remember the, re the other half of that line? Some of you are already repeating it at your screen right now. You're repeating it back. But God meant it for good. Now that's the choreographing scene. Friend, I know that we use these verses flippantly sometimes, but they're true, and we got to get our mind around them. This is why we can assume that no matter what happens to us, God still loves us, and he's doing something good in us and through us. For those who love God and are called according, those, uh, back up. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let me make a little side comment here, another sidebar. You say, well, I wish that were true of me. I'm not sure it is. I wish that were true. I'm not sure it's true of me right now. Really? Why? Why? Because you can give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ right this second and be one of these people who knows that they've been called. And if you can sense that he's calling you, that's him calling you. And when you respond, you are one of these people for whom God works together, even the pain of life, for your good. Wouldn't that be a wonderful way to live? If you haven't given your life to Christ, you should. Just for this promise alone. It's wonderful. Anyway, so the first piece of advice is assume that the Lord loves you and is doing something good in you and through you. Second piece of advice, do whatever is in front of you in the crisis, but trust God with how, the turn, how it turns out. We have to manage and navigate crisis. In these last 10 days, we have um, done our very best here on the campus with the wonderful volunteers we've had to try to make food in some significant numbers, anywhere from 50 to 100 meals uh, being prepared from five o'clock in the morning until nine, one evening, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, we we're still making meals. And we had to remain flexible about how it was gonna turn out so that we were constantly wondering what's gonna happen next. Well, we'll get ready to do this, we'll do the best we can with it, and we'll see how it turns out. 
Is that faithful living? It totally is faithful living. See, that's trusting the providence of God. That's doing what's in front of you to the best of your ability and then trusting that providentially it's going to work out. You try to save your home from a fire. You do the best you can to do it. If in order to save your life, you have to leave your home, you, you still have to trust the providence of God in that. You do everything in your power to do what's right at the time, and then you trust the Lord. Um, in James, it's an interesting uh, passage. Turn, it's, this is a famous passage that I turn to fairly often. James chapter 4. Uh, see if you can find James chapter 4. It's right after Hebrews. James says in chapter 4, verse 13, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we're going to go do such and such in this town. We're going to spend time there. We're going to trade and, and make a profit. He said, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Boy, isn't that the truth? You know, Monday, we did not know that Tuesday, this whole valley would be on fire. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Well, so much for human pride, planning our work and working our plan, thinking we're really in charge of everything. So much for that. He says, you don't know. This is completely realistic. And it's kind of a slam. It, it, it makes us think, well, does it do any good for me to plan? Well, yeah, but you have to leave it in God's hands. See, that's the point. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. Now, he doesn't say not to plan. He doesn't say not to do your best. He doesn't say not to put your hand to the plow, make your investments, start your businesses, do whatever it is that's in front of you to do. What he says is, if you do that and you don't leave the outcome in God's hands, uh, well, later in the passage, he says, that's arrogant. And it's a bad way to live. You got to do whatever's in front of you in a crisis, but then you have to leave the, leave the results in God's hands. And that, it's doable, but it's difficult. It's counterintuitive. Because what happens is, we say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. Let's say, let's say you're going to try and save your house from the fire that's coming, the forest fire. And you're saying, I'm going to do my best to save my house. Well, then it doesn't work out and you lose your house. You know what happens in, at that point is, because we have decided how we think it ought to turn out, if it doesn't turn out that way, then we are crushed in our spirit, angry at God, whatever the case may be, because we didn't trust the providence in addition to doing everything that was in front of us. So this balance of doing everything, putting all of our effort into the right direction, but then standing back in a sense and saying whatever the Lord wills. See, that's what that James passage is all about. It doesn't mean not to do stuff. It means to do it and leave it in God's hands. A good reminder for, especially for people who are really goal-oriented and have been taught, they've been to assertiveness training courses uh, and have been taught that they can actually control details, make plans, work their plans, create success. Uh, the Lord says, eh, do all that, but you leave it. You leave the ultimate reality in my hands. This is how to navigate difficult times. Number one, assume that the Lord loves you and is doing something good in you and through you. Make that assumption. Remind yourself of it constantly. Number two, do whatever's in front of you in the crisis. Put your hand to the plow. We all changed all of our work stuff uh, for the past 10 days. And so many people just simply stopped doing what they were normally doing, pitched in all across the boards. Firefighters, people here making food. The crisis made everyone do what was in front of them. But we all had to remember we really don't know how it's going to turn out. We're going to trust God while we work hard at it. Okay. And here's the third thing and the final thing in terms of advice. Focus past this age. Listen carefully. Focus past this age in order to keep this age in perspective. Focus past this age in order to keep this age in perspective. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and pick it up in verse 16.
Paul has been talking about uh, having this treasure in jars of clay. That's where the music group got its name. Uh, we are cracked jars of clay, and there's this glorious life inside of us. We, we often are failures, but the life of God is inside of us. That's what he's talking about. But then in verse 16, he says, we do not lose heart. Have you lost heart? Have you lost heart? You look at the political scene in our world, you see how our world has changed in the last generation? Have you lost heart? Paul says, we do not lose heart. Why? Though our outer nature is wasting away, and by the way, the whole world is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. In Psalm 23, it says, the Lord refreshes and restores my soul. My shepherd restores my soul. The world, our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. That's why we don't lose heart. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. Now see, that's what, that's what I mean by focusing past this age in order to keep this age in perspective. So that you realize what's coming is infinitely better than what we have here. As we look Look at this. As we look, not at the things that are seen. What's he saying? He's saying, look at stuff you can't see. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Look at stuff you can't see. We look not at things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. We use the phrase here from Ephesians chapter 1, the phrase cardioptics. I picked it up years ago from an author I read. Uh, and he coined the phrase cardioptic. It's heart sight. That's the kind of seeing he's talking about here. So focusing on the invisible, and in this case, it's temporally invisible, meaning something in the future that you haven't seen yet, but it's absolute certainty. And when you get there, you're going to see it. But I want you to see it now. I want you to use your imagination properly, and that is take what God says and say, I know that that's a real thing, and I'm focusing on it. We look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, look at this, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So this is the last piece of advice in this little message. Focus past this age in order to keep this age in perspective. A lot of people figure that they will think about heaven when they get there assuming they're going to be there. And they make fun of people who think about heaven now. You hear this phrase from time to time. Oh, so-and-so is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. We need to strike that phrase from our, from our repertoire and not use it. Because in order to be of any earthly good, we have to keep our mind on heavenly realities, on the future, and on the invisible realm. This is what Paul is actually saying, point blank. This is how he survives. Second Corinthians is filled with a lot of the suffering of the Apostle Paul. It's very autobiographical, and it talks a lot about his own personal suffering. How did he subsist? This is how, right here. This, he's explaining how. In order to keep a perspective on a fallen world, he has to look at the next age and keep his mind on it in order to see how to, how to live best in this age. <clears throat> And I must say that there are many Christians who think it's foolish to think too much about heaven. They think you're not, you're not doing enough on earth. I mean, you hear this quite a bit. And I must say the people that have done the best on earth are the people who actually have had their minds on heaven and knew that they would eventually give an answer for their entire life here and looked forward to the day when they, when they would have that, that glorious inheritance. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because um, we, if, if you've ever had a, a vacation coming up, the, as you approach the vacation, your work, you're happier in your work. In fact, I've seen it. I've seen it every place I've ever worked, including here. Um, work is normal. You know, you, you've got your responsibilities, you, you're, you're putting in your time, you're doing what you need to, you're dealing with the stresses of whatever your job is. And then all of a sudden you see one of your coworkers and they're particularly happy and joyful, you know? 
And you think to yourself, wow, they're happy today. And I'm telling you, you find out later, oh, well, their vacation starts next week. And they're looking forward to it. And it, it, it gives them a perspective on the work that they're doing today. Now, see, that whole idea, that's what I'm talking about. That's what Paul was talking about. Having the, the next age clearly in view and knowing how wonderful it is enables us to face with a certain amount of joy, uh, a certain amount of poise, a certain amount of calm. Keep calm and carry on. Why? Because what, we're, what is seen is transient. James says the same thing. It's temporary. What is unseen is eternal, and your heart and life are anchored in that eternal reality. So, as we navigate these difficult days, and we have some difficult days ahead of us as well, helping people rebuild, restructuring lives that have been uh, burned, literally burned, um, it, it behooves us as Christians to think in these ways. Assume that the Lord loves you as a Christian and is using you, working in you good and using you for good, do whatever's in front of you, but trust the providence of God. Focus past this age in order to keep this age in perspective. Why can we do this? That's exactly what Jesus did. That is exactly what Jesus did. You read in the high priestly prayer that he prayed before he was crucified, before the worst crime ever committed against anyone. And he said, Father, I'm looking forward to sharing with you the glory that we had before the world was. He teaches us to do these things in a fallen world, to live in this way. So may the Lord grant to us the ability to live wisely in difficult times through what he teaches us in the word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would grant to us the ability to live wisely and faithfully, knowing that you alone are the one who sustains us by your sovereign grace, and that even though we live in a time of significant crisis in our own community and in our broader world, Father, would you allow us to be representatives of your light and your truth and your hope? Would you allow us to live wisely and well for your honor and glory? In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>